Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keep It Awesome. We got a really special episode today. Film, we are filming not live, so you're not watch, no one's watching this live like we usually do. Uh, we have a very special guest. Our guest today is Katie Rosenberg. She's a, one of two mayoral candidates. She'll be running against incumbent mayor Bob Milkey. And we're not live, but we are filming at Whitewater Music Hall in downtown Wausau. So one of the things I want to tell you about, so I, normally I would read the dates and tell you what's, what's coming up with Whitewater, but by the time you get this, it'll be out of date. So instead, I'm going to talk about their brand, these brand new like half sandwiches they're doing. Katie, have you had those? Oh, the fancy toast. The fancy toast. They're so good. <laughs> they're, really, they're really tasty. And I, like, uh, the idea is sort of like they're like avocado toast, but then they have all these different kinds. Oh, like, apple uh, and blue cheese. And yeah, oh my gosh. Super good. Yeah, I, I, I've eaten probably too many of them already, but uh, <laughs> this is a good place to hang out. So stop on down, grab a grab one of their homemade beers. They do them right here and in the back. I finally got to see the back room the other day during uh, my producer Harold Harold's uh, Substyle show. Yeah, by the way, our new producer. Uh, we want to give a shout out to him, Harold Mello. What's going on, Harold? <laughs> you know, we need to get you a mic too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Harold's going to be working behind the cameras from now on. Uh, he's, he's recording it. We've got fancy mics now instead of my, my internet mic microphone that I bought. Oh. So that's really exciting. So this is a new setup. Yeah. Uh, we, we, well, the video is brand, new, brand, brand new for today. Nice. And Harold, Harold, was, Harold and Matt from Substyle were a guest. Uh, what was it two weeks ago now? Two weeks ago. And you yeah. got roped into this. And so... Well, he kind of roped me into it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, Harold's like, you know, I invited, well, I invited Matt, and I said, well, you know, I can't have five people that's yeah. on the show. That's too many, but maybe you could bring one or two other people. And he goes, oh, I'll bring Harold, because Harold loves podcasts. And then Harold instantly friend requested me and oh, said, that's great. and then wanted to produce the show. And I was like, that's cool Done. with me, man. Let's try it out and see, see how it goes. And uh, so far, so good. So welcome, welcome, Harold Mello. And if you haven't checked out Substyle, it's, they're, they're a really great band. They played here last Friday. Super good. I, I had a lot of fun. And uh, their new EP, Letters, Letters or Letter? Letters. Letters is out. Uh, you can see it on Spotify and YouTube. You can listen. They have, like, lyrics where you can see the lyrics while you listen to it. Oh, That's pretty nice. cool. Sing along. Yeah. And where else is it available, Harold? Or how do you get a physical copy? Can you go to, like, in, can you go to Intersleep? Are you going to press no. it on vinyl? No, because uh, we ran out. Oh, it ran out. It sold out. Yeah. Well, sold good. out by popular demand. But you can listen to it on <laughs> Spotify and YouTube and iTunes and all that other fun stuff. But uh, yeah, enough enough promo stuff. You know, I, I got in the studio, outside the studio, technically. <laughs> I've got Katie Rosenberg. Katie, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm good. Katie, you are obsessed with Peloton. Oh my gosh, me. we're diving right into the I topic. went to right into the Peloton, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I am obsessed. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, I just finished my 30th day of Peloton. Wow. And I am going to hit mile 300 today when I'm done with this. So, nice. yeah, obsessed. Nice. I love it. Mile and I'm actually discovering there's like an underbelly of Wasa that is also obsessed with Peloton. Really? So it's connecting me to some really interesting people. Wow, that's that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. So this is like, I remember you kind of describing it a little bit. This is a big door ordeal to get one of these things. Like, it's not like you just go to the store and buy a yeah, box. Yeah, no. You um, you have to order it online, mm -hmm. and you have to make this commitment. Mm -hmm. You can pay installments, um, but you have to buy the bike. Um, mm -hmm. Or they also have a treadmill, which is so fancy and even more expensive. Right. Um, and then you have to buy oh, wow. the, uh, the subscription to the classes, which mm -hmm. you can do live or on demand. I started doing the live classes because it kind of got me in the habit, like, oh, I got to go now, got to do this. Um, mm -hmm. But now I'm kind of in busy mode. Yeah. So I'll ride maybe at nine at night or 11 at night or six in the morning or like whenever I can. So, so you like the live classes when you can, cause it I creates do. that sense of urgency. Like, Oh, I yes. got to get there. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing is, and this is, this is something that Peloton is amazing mm -hmm. at. They gamified the whole thing, like working out. So oh, nice. you, um, you get different kind of medallions. If you've worked, you know, I rode maybe 150 miles. So I get a gold medallion mm -hmm. or whatever. But then if you're in a live class and it's, a milestone class, so like your hundredth class or your hundred and fiftieth or or your two thousandth, um, your name mm -hmm. pops up to the instructor and they give you a shout out. Oh, nice! I know. So I'm when I get to my fiftieth, I will do a live class and I'll record it. I will probably mm -hmm. be insufferable on social media about it, so be ready. <laughs> 
if any of you at home want to buy a Peloton, <laughs> go to Peloton.com slash BC Kowalski. Oh, I wish. It did sound like a commercial for yeah, it, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It, it's really just an obsession. I don't get anything out of this other than, you know, yeah, more me, motivation. Yeah, me neither, but at Peloton, if you want to send me a check, I would probably take it. <laughs> or a test a test ride, like if you're listening for some reason, I would yeah. I would take one of those. No, it sounds really cool. And I, can, I, I heard you can get the app too, right? Yeah, you, so you can get the app without mm-hmm. having the bike. Um, and yeah. actually, I'm trying to think of one of my friends who does that. Oh, Laura. You know Laura. Oh, Laura, yeah. um, Laura has the app, and she um, has a bike that she bought from the YMCA. So the she, Laura Schulte? Uh, Scuderi. Oh, Scuderi. So we have so many Laura friends. You could have said Laura S. Still would have got I it wrong. I know. <laughs> so she, she's she been doing that, and she loves it. Um, so, mm. yeah. Well, shout out, shout out to Laura Scuderi. Your fantasy football team sucks, though. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how she, I, I mean, she doesn't strike me yeah. as the football Person. Her and my my boss are in the fantasy football league. Oh my gosh! So that's why I give her a hard time. Yeah, okay, I get it. So whenever I see her, I tell her my boss said that her team sucks and mm. she's bad at fantasy football. Yeah. And then I, of course I do the opposite to Tammy. I tell, of course. I was like, yeah, Laura was like totally bashing <laughs> your team. <laughs> I mean, that's what you got to do, right? It's fun. That is what you do for fantasy football. March Madness coming up. Am I allowed to say that? No. I think so. Hopefully, <laughs> okay. it's still coming don't up. Don't say the was, Olympics, or I just it might not so. be coming up. But <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure when this is going to air. So, oh, okay. Well, yeah, I hope hopefully, hopefully early March is what I'd hope. Okay. Yeah. Well. So uh, yeah. How much is the Peloton app just? Um, gosh, I don't know. It's somewhere between maybe $30 a month around there. Mm-hmm. Maybe now I just have it automatically coming out of my, sure. <laughs> my account. So, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> So, it, I mean, it is a little expensive. For it is, thing. yeah. And uh, the devices, mm-hmm. contraption is pretty mm-hmm. expensive, too, as, yeah. as I recall. Yeah, but, you know, you justify everything you want in life. And I, you yeah. know, wasn't making it to the Y as frequently as I wanted to. Sure. So I just had to come up with something because I know I feel better. I sleep better. <laughs> well, I got to think for you, too, going, like going to a Y now is kind of tricky, right? Like. You know, I, I, I'm sure you have this experience. I, I have this to a minor extent that, you know, it's hard for me to go somewhere without knowing somebody. Yeah, you're... I have I have the benefit of, like, my name being known and not my face as much. So like I, I had don't... a couple people ask me, is that B.C. Kowalski? Oh, like, really? I'm like, Brian? Yeah, <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, they, they... So, okay, there are some people that maybe... Yeah, B.C., well, I end up, I do end up on TV sometimes. Like my parents will say like, oh yeah, we saw you on TV. <laughs> Oddly enough, they're, they're like, they're more excited about seeing me like oh, appear on TV in, they... kind of in the random corner than they are like, hey, it was a great story. <laughs> but you were, you were in the courtroom and the story may be. <laughs> yeah, right. I have nothing to do with the story, but they're never like, you're like, yeah, your story last week. It's always like, hey, we saw you on TV. <laughs> yeah. I got a text message from my mom last night. Oh, I just saw you on TV. You did a nice job. And then about, I don't know, two minutes later, she said, oh, my gosh, your dad was on TV, too. So whatever he was talking about, we happened to just be two minutes apart. So Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm curious about this, too, because is that something that you sort of got used to as a kid with with your dad, Jim Rosenberg, being so so well known in the community having been on city council and county board for yeah. so long yeah i would say um it's a little bit different to have somebody you love being involved versus you so yeah whenever anyone would say mean things about my dad like i would get fired up and want to fight them that would be right <laughs> but now if, be somebody, if somebody says something mean about me i'm just Meh. So you have like, more I, thick skin for yourself. But than I see like, my husband kind of getting wound up, or my friends. Like I was just telling you, I'm <laughs> getting tagged in a million things on Facebook, right, and I yeah. know they're I know they're duking it out about me. And I just, what are you gonna do? <laughs> That's got to be hard to have like a spouse. <laughs> and I know, especially you know, I guess this is maybe a little sexist, but like, especially if you're a guy and you're like your sp- female spouse is getting attacked, <laughs> like that kind of like you know. That, that kind of hits you in a way that... Yeah, I mean, anybody really that you really care about and you see mean things mm-hmm. about them, it just kind of fires you up. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Dave knows me better than almost anybody on the planet. I mean, we mm-hmm. obviously, we, <laughs> we live together for, and we have for a long time. Um, it's tough because he knows that my motivations, he knows what's driving mm-hmm. me. And if somebody just says something, you know, flippant about like, oh, she's just another corrupt politician... He knows that no, yeah, she's not. Right. <laughs> she cares about stuff and she's up until midnight. But you know, what are you gonna do? You can't fight with every internet commenter. It's not worth your time ever, actually. 
Did you did you always think that you wanted to be a a, a politician? Like I know you're I know you're pretty like you know you're you're, you're pretty much a policy geek, which is really yes, I really love cool. policy. Yeah. So I kind of assumed that if I went in this direction, mm-hmm. I would be maybe somebody's chief of staff or sure. you know maybe a communications director or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, really, so more maybe, like a Maggie Gao than a yes, a yeah. Tony so Evers. so I imagine that. Um, but here we are. Yeah, right. <laughs> We make decisions. <laughs> well, what prompted you to run for like county board in the first place? And I know you, you initially had applied as a oh yeah a, you know an applicant candidate for right. a vacant. Uh, well, and then that was your dad. Your, that was when yeah. your dad moved and so that was what twenty fifteen maybe. Yeah. So my dad mm-hmm. um, was the county board supervisor for District One, and I live three blocks away from where I grew up. Um, mm-hmm. Which sounds really exciting, I'm sure, to everybody. But, you know, yeah, right. he had represented that seat. Um, he's been on there since maybe 2002. Well, it's interesting because you live on the southeast side. Mm-hmm. Um, Milky grew up on the southeast side. Mm-hmm. And I currently live on the southeast side. I mean, really, it's yeah. one of those lovers of power is the southeast side. It is, yeah. It's apparently the... <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my dad in the summer of 2015 resigned. Mm-hmm. And... I actually was reading the city pages and he had done an interview with Pat Peckham and he had said something like, well, I'm going to encourage my daughter to apply for that vacancy. And I read it and I was like, what? Wait, that's me. (laughs) When are we going to have this conversation? Um, So, but you know, you start thinking about it and you're like, you know, he did a really nice job. And then you start to wonder, like, I don't know everything. You know, I, I worked Mm -hmm. at channel nine for several years. So I know, um, I know about government and I know like how mm-hmm. voting works and I know the right. issues, but I never really thought about myself as, oh, let's make decisions mm-hmm. on this. Let's yeah. decide how this money is spent. So, you know, it took me a little while to think about what, mm-hmm. what should I do here? Um, but I applied and, um, I didn't get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and actually that was kind of, you know, you, you don't really think about how that's going to be. i I don't know. And you were one of four, was it? No, it there was, were only it was, two. Oh, it was just you and Shane, right. Shane Corneo? Yeah, yeah. Who, uh, by the way, lived about, I think he lived like two blocks away from me. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I didn't get it, and, um, you know, they decided very quickly that I didn't get it, and I don't know. I know my dad was kind mm-hmm. of a uh, an interesting character on that board. Uh, yeah. Ravel Rouser, what is it? I don't know. He, I mean, he challenges people. Mm-hmm. Um Eloquently, so I would say. Mm-hmm. Well, with thirty-eight with thirty-eight members, I would hope there'd be a few rebel rousers. <laughs> right? It'd be kind of hard to avoid, you know. Yeah. I, I, you know, you've seen like smaller boards where you don't maybe see that per, that challenging personality type because yep. there's just only like five or six people. But mm-hmm. um, especially something like the council, and then going to county board where there's now it is the biggest county board in the country. Is that right? That's what they say. Like, um, I've heard I went that, to NACO um, during yeah. the last presidential inauguration, and I mentioned Marathon County, um, and they said, oh, that's the largest board in the nation. Mm-hmm. And I was surprised. Because I think even Chairman Kurt Gibbs had said at one point when they were talking about the potential downsizing that mm-hmm. it was the, the yeah. biggest. And actually, uh, it has been downsized. Um, it used to be when John Robinson was first elected, when he was a teenager, <laughs> right well, out of right. high school. That's right. Um, it had 39 members, so... There you go. Nice. We have downsized sometime in the last 40 years. <laughs> how did you get in? Uh, we're, kind of, we're kind of backing up a oh, little yeah, bit. Sorry. But um, how, did you get, how did you get into journalism in the first place? Like, how did that trans? You was know, that right out of college you became a journalist? So or? it's kind of an interesting, like, roundabout mm-hmm. story. When I was, so I, again, grew up on the southeast side, yeah. right by Channel 9. It's right there, <laughs> yep. And back in the day, they used to have floor crew who did the in-studio cameras um, during the news. Oh, and yeah. that was my first job in high school was a uh, floor crew for Channel 9. So I'd been around the station a lot, um, and I liked it a lot. You know, you just, mm-hmm. it's fun to be around news. And then, you know, as a floor crew, it's, you're there for two hours, two and a half hours at a time, and then you get to go. You don't really see the machinations of what goes on, putting a story together, producing, all of that. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it always kind of stuck in my mind. I went to school with the thought that maybe I would join the Peace Corps or something, you know, like mm-hmm. get a degree, join the Peace Corps, do something, you know, leave Wassa. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that's just not what, you know, I graduated. I, by that time I had started dating Dave mm-hmm. and I kind of want to stick around here. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. So I had talked to the news director at the time and, you know, he knew mm-hmm. me from when I was on the floor crew. Yeah. Um, and we talked about, you know, what are your strengths? What do you do? 
and um, you know, I I majored in philosophy, um, very writing extensive, very about research, uh, research um, and you have to back up your art, uh, arguments with facts. Right. Um, so we talked a little bit about that. And he's like, well, you know, news writing, especially for TV, is not like philosophy writing. So we're going to have to kind of help <laughs> you through this transition. I'm just going to let that comment like slide over. <laughs> well, you, I don't want to get myself in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> don't get yourself in trouble. But again, like it's very yeah. different, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, philosophy, you could spend 16 pages and you might finish it and you're like, okay, where are we at now? Like I just have more questions. But news, you know, you have to be very concise TV yep. news. Uh, maybe you have to talk oh, about really. maybe you have to talk yeah. about continuing resolutions in the budget, and you only get ten seconds to do so. How do you make that message come across? Yeah, it gets you really good at taking very complex subjects and then breaking them down and making them yeah. as simple as you can. You have can. to throw some of that stuff overboard well, that too. Is, and it, yeah, you do. It's um, not easy. It's so, not a, so yeah, he mm-hmm. took a chance on me. He said, "All right, mm-hmm. you're, I'm going to hire you. Um, we'll start you producing the 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. newscasts." So I started doing that. Um, Got real into it. You know, it was pretty cool with the... There's a family of stations that Channel 9's a part of. Um, and so there are some in Madison um, and various places throughout the Midwest. I think there's even mm-hmm. one in West Virginia and New Jersey. Yeah. So we would get together. You have these seminars, these group seminars, and you really talk through, like, okay, this is a story that actually happened. Pick it apart. How would you tell this story? And then, you, you know, because it's TV, mm. you also learn kind of the art of visual storytelling or how to get people hooked on that. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's a lot of education that happened. But, you know, I I started with that. I ended with content um, management. I, I was, it's kind of like a glorified mm-hmm. news uh, news desk person. So you were kind of like me. You kind of had a non-traditional right. route into journalism. I just, right. that's one of the things I kind of worry about today. Like, mm-hmm. Because my and I, w- I was kind of talking to you a little bit about this before the podcast, but I kind of started as a returning adult student. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it'd be fun to, I thought it'd be fun to write some like music and movie reviews. And right. I, I'd always loved newspapers and I always loved writing, but I for some reason it, I just never put the two together. <laughs> Should I do that? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And then um, I found out that Russ Fungal was coming to town, and I thought oh, I should do a news story. I could. I could do that. Like, Mm -hmm. I'll interview him and do a story. And so my very first interview ever was with U.S. Senator Russ Feingold. That's amazing. Which is, like, kind of a trial by fire, but he was pretty cool about it, too. So, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it was a little, it was intimidating. When when you're, like, you're, like, you know, some 28-year-old who's, like, (laughs) you know, halfway through community college, right? I mean, returning adult student and, uh. You know, it really struck me, and the reason I think I took to journalism, like, I thought it was really cool to interview Russ Feingold, but mm-hmm. um, I inter- before him, I interviewed some Vietnam War vets. Oh, my gosh. And what was so interesting about it to me is I, I always thought, oh, veterans, they would be Republican, and here were, here were you know, some veterans who were Democrat, mm-hmm. you know, obviously. And I, I, think, I think two things came out of that for me. One... I had an opportunity to challenge my assumptions. Right. And I've been doing that ever since. And number I, one rule number of one rule. journalism. I mean, you can't go mm. into it and just assume. <laughs> right. It, it's a skill I think you learn and then I think it makes you a better person mm-hmm. because you think, wait, wait, what am I not what am I missing or what am I not thinking about? That's why here? I don't see you commenting mean things on Facebook, right? <laughs> I'm like off of I don't do any mean things. I'm like, you know Well, you know Brad Carger had had a had a great phrase that I've been keeping in mind. He said, "He said uh, the only the only topics I have strong opinions about are the ones I don't know enough about." I'm like, I <laughs> oh love my that. gosh, yeah. You know, he's such a good leader. We really uh, were lucky to have him, and I feel lucky that I got to know him so well too. Yeah, me too. I learned a lot from him just just being a leader and just being a mm-hmm. being a good human. But you know, he he was one of those people that would also stand up for you know, maybe people that didn't have a voice, you know, I just think, Mm -hmm. and he would take a chance and he does that, right? He's still doing that. (laughs) Yeah. I think he did that, but he also, he also was very, um, was a very pragmatic guy, Mm -hmm. you know, um, he was always very, very, um, I like how we're talking talking about 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 like he's he's, he's dead. Yeah. He's just in Florida. Brad is alive and well. He's alive. He's just in Florida. (laughs) But, uh, um, yeah, he always, he always had a really good way of like, being very matter of fact, like, yeah. here's option one. This is why it might suck, mm-hmm. but it's your option. Here's option two. 
Sucks a little less, but also does this. And here's option three. Probably the best option, but that's up to you. And I think he was really good at making people feel like they were making that decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought he was really good at presenting, not like really telling people what to, what to think, but kind of saying like, hey, here's how, here's, a, here's how you can look at it and come to your own Building conclusion. Building consensus. He was mm-hmm. an expert in that and being diplomatic. I mean, it's a testament that he was able to like kind of help me through the process of North Central Healthcare, um, mm-hmm. but also the people who really wanted to see that tri-county agreements you know, destroyed. He helped them too. And mm-hmm. we all came to the same conclusion. So, I mean, that's, that's Brad. That was Brad. <laughs> I'm sure he learned a lot from that process too. I mean, I, I know he changed his mind throughout that. <laughs> um, you know, well, he was one of the people that had the idea that they would start, the county would start as their own mm-hmm. health and human services department. Yeah, that was one of, yeah. it was a challenging thing to hear um, mm-hmm. because I obviously think very highly of his opinions and um, thoughts on things and hearing a county, a county department and then seeing how that um, did not quite resonate with the people that uh, worked there and, and ran that, you know, those conversations mm-hmm. were important to have. Yeah, I can't say any more about that <laughs> than not, but... Um, I think I think overall I think I, I'm safe in saying that the outcomes that were achieved were, you know, I think made everyone happy. So, mm-hmm. um, but going yeah going back so that was one the one thing I learned and the other thing I took away from that experience was um, how excited they were to tell me their story and how I got to give them a voice. Right. And that that's one of the things that I took away and I said, wow, I can make a living at this. I could do mm-hmm. this for a living and this would be an awesome way to make a living. Yeah. Not a, not a huge living, mind you, but uh, we know how that is in journalism. But And then, you know, when, when I did my first story for the Herald, I had done a job shadowing. I ran. I met Mark Baldwin. Do you remember Mark Baldwin? Oh, yes, I remember Mark Baldwin. I met him at an event on campus, and I said, hey, do you guys do do you guys do uh, job shadowing? He's like, he's like, yeah, we do, Brian. Come on in. And so, <laughs> so I came in, and I got to meet. You sound like I know. The, the mafia. Well, yeah, that, like, he just had that voice like Yeah. <laughs> you know, you respected the hell out of him. Also, like, kind of intimidating, too. Oh, yeah. Well, I remember, so he, he ended up helping me get the job at the Stevens Point Journal. Cause oh, that's he knew great. Me from, you know, he, he knew my work from uh, from working at the Herald. But I did the job shadowing. I met, like, Amber Pollock. Did you, did you remember I her I remember at all? that name. Joe Christopher. They were, they were kind of, like, he, they were both editors there at the time. Sure. And, uh. Gosh, that paper has gone through such a transformation. Oh, it has. Yeah, <laughs> it has. All newspapers, I suppose, but wow. Yeah, it really did. And uh, so I met her, you know, I met her, and then, like, that night I was at, like, the Star Wars, the premiere of, like, the Star Wars, <laughs> the new Star Wars movie, and I said, hey, do you want a story on this? This is, like, huge. There's tons of people here. Yeah. Like, way more than anyone thought. And she's like, yeah, yeah, do, go ahead, do it. So I wrote my very first uh, Amazing. story for the Herald. You know, no, no schooling, no nothing. Like, I got that opportunity. They could see how hungry I was. That's um, awesome. They, you know, they, they would give me feedback. There. And then uh, Joel Christopher reached out to me and said, yeah, you should, you should come in and talk to us. We, we have more opportunities for you. And he's like, he's like Brian, we, we love it when people just, like, really want to go for this and just right. put in the effort. So they're like, like, if you want more freelance stories. Let's go. Um, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and so I did a few more of those. And then they said, well, we should really get you on the payroll. So how about, how about we put you as a part-timer in the sports department? Oh, boy. Did you like that? Well, here's the funny thing. So, were you in school at the time? I was. You were finishing it up. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I, I, I was still at. I like how we turned the tables. I'm interviewing you now. Totally. I'm <laughs> getting interviewed. <laughs> I'm stealing the show. Um, yeah. So I, I was like not a sports guy at the time. Huh. I, I'm now kind of pretty much a sports dude. Yeah, you are. In kind of a weird way, but but you're then like into I, the the underground kind of sports. Well, it kind of got me. I was always into like like mountain biking and sure yeah they would call like the, I, I would always go cover the stuff that they didn't want to like <laughs> like no one else cared about mountain biking adventure or, or kayaking or, or cross-country <laughs> skiing or curling they sent me to a lot of curling oh yeah mostly I took calls in the office sure, for like sure. all, you know because that's like they covered like four it was like the sports department for like four of course um four papers so you were taking calls from Marshfield and oh, Stevens yeah. Point yeah 
And, uh, you know, it was kind of trial by fire. Like, there's a lot of names, and you've got to get them right. <laughs> Our parents will be ticked. So, oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, you know, I really, I think I really grew my accuracy skills from that. Um, I think we could have done better systematically sometimes, too, but... That's neither here nor there. Right. Like now just, they probably just text made, them. Like it would have made sense to me to have all the like a booklet of all the rosters so you could just. Right. Because sometimes the coaches would get mad if they had to spell it, and I thought, why didn't we do that? But, you know, that's interesting. I'm I'm like remembering back at Channel Nine, we used to have Friday night lights. They probably still do. I just don't. I do other things mm-hmm. on Friday nights now, um, and we would actually have people from news doing the sports and they would all come back with their little paper rosters and I think it's this one and <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah it was you know yeah I, I got a trial by and I had to learn how the sports worked that I didn't really know a lot like, I, I don't know about volleyball I mean yeah. I, I know the basic idea of like I knew the basic idea of it but I don't know like you know all the rules or what a set spike is or all this other all this I just other gave stuff. that guy the look good yeah <laughs> Hill's, gonna, Hill's on it yeah that's cool but um, yeah, so I learned I learned about sports, and I came to appreciate them because I learned that every every game is like a confluence of like novels. Like you have all these novels <laughs> that everyone everyone has their own novel. Sure. Everyone, because I learned like how much when people get to like the professional level, or even even getting really good on like a collegiate level. Right. How much work goes on behind the scenes, and how yeah. much and how much like chance is involved, and just you know. It, it, I and really, it's also I treating really, your mind right. Like it's it not is, just yeah. physical. Like you really have to be on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I learned to really appreciate. It. Like I, I feel like everyone's novel kind of comes to a climax at this. This is all the climaxes kind of happen in this one sporting event, <laughs> and that's what got me. Then when I realized that, it became more interesting to me. Yeah. Like the story behind the the game. Yeah. So that's me. But uh, I love it. <laughs> I'm like, yep, yep, yep. All no, it's good. BC. <laughs> you should. Yeah, BC Kowalski. Who's that guy? <laughs> so in, when, you, and when you were watching your dad grow up, did you ever yeah. think, like, I want to I wanna do that too? Or you were like, oh, heck no. I don't want to well, get that feedback. You know, it's interesting because I kind mm-hmm. of had... So my dad, obviously, is very extroverted. And um, he is out and about. I remember as a kid, he would bring me to various things. You know, I remember one Saturday morning, he's like, oh, we got to go to the farmer's market. You got to meet this guy. I was like, okay. You know, I don't know how old I was. I must have been nine or something. Mm -hmm. So we get there and there's this little old man and everyone's gathered around him and there's cameras and stuff. And I was like, okay. And my dad introduced, he's like, oh, Senator Cole, this is my daughter, Katie. (laughs) And he was real excited. And he's like, all right, I need you to spell school. And I did. And I was like, why is, of course I know how to spell school. I'm in fourth grade. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, you know, so my dad, like, Mm -hmm. injected these opportunities into my life regularly. I didn't, you know, you don't really think about it until after. And you're like, oh, my gosh, that was pretty cool of him to bring me along. Um, you know, I, we have gone on these father-daughter trips uh, since I was in uh, same, probably the same age. You know, there's that, mm-hmm. that time in October where um, the teachers have their conventions or in-services or whatever, and the kids yeah. have off. So my dad always used that opportunity to take me somewhere. Um, and, you know, the first t- trip we went on, it was out to the Badlands to see, oh, nice. <laughs> you know, to see all that stuff out there. And then we progressively started doing kind of different things and at one point you know I remember I was in college we're still going on these trips together yeah. and um where I was looking on uh northwest at the time and I was like oh there are tickets to Istanbul we really need to go and and, <laughs> and you know it, it must have been like 11 at night and he's like all right let's just book it let's do it we'll, we'll go and we went wow. and it happened to be during one of their election cycles and so we're rolling into town and giant mass of people leaving rallies and things, and you see these cars driving around, and they they literally park outside the banks while people are waiting in line at the ATMs, uh, and and blast them with campaign messages, and and of course, like the week before we went, uh, the other side of the city got bombed because I mean it was wow, and so the, it's that moment when you're like, man. Maybe we need to think about this stuff a little bit more. But also, I'm so excited and energized by this. You know, when Lula was first elected president of Brazil, we happened to be there during election time. You see the posters plastered everywhere. You just get kind of energized by the whole thing. Huh. Um, 
So yeah, and actually, you know, we you still... and I had a very different experience <laughs> growing up. <laughs> I mean, because eventually they turned into like kind of nerdy trips, right? Like, don't you didn't you guys go to like the Iowa caucuses and stuff? Oh yeah. yeah. So that was more recently. And actually, my dad and I were pumped to do this. Um, we went mm-hmm. to the Iowa. It wasn't the caucus. It was the state fair. Oh. Okay. And um, I that's was a real... big. That's a big too. Yes. That's so a big we went. Event. And actually, you know how far away Des Moines is to drive. Like, it just we probably should have flown, but. Um, it was it was really fun. We saw Bernie um, on the stage, the the soapbox stage, by, uh, hosted by the Des Moines Register. Uh, we saw Trump's helicopter flying over, and of course, at that time, nobody really. I mean, we were still up in the air of who the candidate was going to be. Oh yeah, I'm fascinated um, by like I, I love like when any political figures come. Me like, too. Like I was super jazzed that I walked by Laura Trump uh, at the mall. <laughs> I didn't know it was. I didn't know who. I wasn't sure it was her. But. Yeah. But it looked like a woman that didn't belong in Wausau. Like, yeah. Looked like she belonged in New York or <laughs> Somewhere. Washington. Or, so I was like, hmm. And she was, and I saw, when I came by, because I was coming from a county meeting, and I saw all the, uh, the limo, or the Escalades, I guess. Right. You know, black SUVs. And I could see that they weren't, they had like Illinois plates. So I'm like, all right, it's not, it's not like a governor or a state official. Yeah. And I hadn't heard about the, the uh, speech yet or oh, yeah. the rally yet. So I didn't know who it was. And I walked by and then I, I looked at her. I'm like, I wonder who that was. I'm like, she kind of looked like it. Like, it actually kind of looked like. Um, she kind of looked a little like Melania. Oh. Like had the you know the high cheekbones. Sure, sure. That. I was like, but it's not her. I know it's not her. And I saw I saw Kirk, and he the mall manager was kind of like <laughs> looking like like watching them. And I was like, Kirk. should I take a picture of this? <laughs> I was like, Kirk, who is that? And, he goes, I think it's Laura Trump. And then so when I got back to the office, I Googled her. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's her. That was her. <laughs> so then I made a joke about the Trumps buying the mall. And everyone, t- everyone's like, no, oh. that's not what it was. I'm like, obviously. <laughs> it's kind of a sensitive no, I really topic. No, I really think Trump's going to buy the Wasa Center Mall. <laughs> like, come on, people. Yeah, so. So I think you and I, I think you and I might have been in D.C. at the same time. I know, oh, really? I know your dad was. Because I was at the second Bush inauguration. Okay, yeah. So Are I actually didn't go to that one. Okay, just your dad was there. Yeah, he was there by himself. Because I ended up interviewing him afterwards. Oh, yeah. He actually texted me. He's like, oh, I, I accidentally went to the the ball where the, the Bush twins were. <laughs> I was like, that's really funny. Um, and I, then I was like, you know, next time I'm going with you, I have to. <laughs> well, it was, it was wild. Like so, And this was where Jeff Decker comes in because I... He's he's like yeah we gotta go we gotta go to the inauguration and we yeah. like, we drove down to Madison made our way onto this bus that left from Madison you took a bus we took a bus whoa like a bus of like it was all like protester types oh sure yeah and I mean I, I basically rode in the bus with them I wasn't a part of it mm. and I was a student journalist at the time so yeah I was likely gonna, story I was gonna write about my experience <laughs> it, it was a, it in was your a live wild. journal. It was wild because so I didn't I didn't get, you know, in I didn't have tickets so I didn't get into it. Uh, so I was okay, okay. outside, but there was like crazy amounts of protests. That's interesting. And then I and then I messaged my, I ended up talking with one of my friends who was like super into politics, mm-hmm. and he was like, yeah, I watched I watched the TV coverage. They didn't talk about that at all. And it was no, it was kind of like one of those first glimpses of. Like, maybe there's some issues with national news. And, you know, <laughs> lately I've been kind of feeling that a lot. I feel like there's some, some things that really bother me, but... Um, it's tough. It um, is tough. It's a tough world. Like, I, You know, I used to watch national news all the time. I just mm-hmm. don't anymore. I watch PBS News Hour because I figure if it's boring, <laughs> like, it must be helping me learn a little bit more. Well, social media has changed this stuff so oh, much. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, now, like, something breaks on Twitter. Yep. News is struggling to keep up. Yeah. If you don't do something, you're biased. You're behind. You're behind. You're yeah. You're yeah. biased, or you know, you're behind the. You're you're, you're slacking off and not yeah. calling, covering the story. But if you jump on it too quickly, you don't have the time to really vet what you're seeing and understand it. Yep. Um, I think that happened with. Uh, well, actually, I better not talk about that. But <laughs> well, I can tell you. Um, yeah. I went to Channel Nine recently. Uh-huh. They interviewed me. Yeah. I mean. I'm getting interviewed by everybody. Yeah. Um, and I, afterwards, I talked to Melissa Langben for a little bit. You know, I worked with her for a long time. Shout out to Melissa Langben. Yeah, she's amazing. We're so lucky to have her. That was like one of the two times <laughs> I felt like I like I was like I made it kind of. You yeah. know, like when I was covering a story with her at the same time. Yep. And before that, when I was covering a, a story with Glenn Moberg at the same time, oh, yeah. he asked me like questions about the case. I was like, Oh yeah. I was like, because I, you know. 
you know, when I was like before I even started journalism, I was like Glenn Moberg was he was the dude. Man. <laughs> He's legit. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, he really sounds like that. You know? Yeah. He's got that deep voice, but I was I was just like, so I was geeking out about Glenn Moberg. Oh yeah. Yeah. I understand. Time. So anyway, talking to Melissa <laughs> and I said, you know, and I heard the scanner blasting in my ear and I was like, wow, I haven't heard that in a while. I don't miss that. Don't miss that either. No. Oh man. Um, and I said, how's it going? I feel like it's really tough to be in news right now. And she said, you know, like we're doing okay locally yeah. um, because, you know, they, they have a pretty good system. Um, they have a series of checks. People will read over stories. You make sure if you have questions, I mean, you really... You have to aggressively uh, fact check and things like that. Yeah. But she said the biggest problem she's having um, is that they really have to be careful about the national news that they pull in. So, oh, you know, from the white, you get an ABC wire, you get an AP wire. But she said some of the national stuff that's coming in from ABC, maybe the scripts don't match what they're saying. And, and if you don't make sure that you are very specific about listening to it, you might get something that feels kind of biased um, and she doesn't want that at all in her any of her newscasts. So that's one of those things that you really... I didn't ever have to worry about that. Oh, it's from ABC. They clearly have fact checkers that right. are more robust than us. Yeah. But it feels like maybe that's... I mean, well, you know how it is. News uh, had a transformation during the recession. And I don't mm -hmm. think some of those other positions that used to fact check... I mean, copy editing doesn't exist anymore, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so to give to give context, I went from when I when I started at the Stevens Point Journal in 2010. Okay. I was one of four reporters. We had a city editor, a managing editor, editors, um, two sports reporters, like front af front office staff, yep. ad salesperson. When I left, I was one of two reporters, I believe, and, and we're sharing an editor with Wasa. And now there's like there's like one guy, right? Who it, like I don't, I don't think, I don't think they have an office. Yeah. I, I'm not gonna say that for sure because I don't wanna. But my understanding is there's like one, one guy doing news and that's it. There's no office. There's no salespeople. Yeah. Everything is regionalized. It's so tough to get the good local stories if you don't mm -hmm. have people that are living there and have the time right. to do it. And you can't get the right story if you don't have somebody checking it for you very rigorously. Yeah. It's it's true, and I. I um, you also need money. I mean, I get it. Like the revenue has changed so much. That's true too. I mean, I struggle with that sometimes. It's a that's a big news hole that I fill every week, and you know I work <laughs> a news hole. It's so hard to not, you know, like you have to kind of slow yourself down and say like I don't care. I have to I have to double check this. Like I have mm -hmm. to make sure I get it right. Yeah. Like it's so hard because you it's so tempting to cut corners when you have to do so much, mm -hmm. and. Speaking of the, of the bias, like one of the things that, that is that is one thing I really like about working at City Pages is that I have people from both political aisles tell me that they love City Pages. Yeah, you know, it's I, important. You know, it's always been really important to me to be balanced. Um, I don't consider myself a Republican or Democrat. I consider myself a pragmatist first and foremost, and I think a lot of my views. A lot of times, I see both sides. Mm -hmm. You know. I think that's important. I think a really good example, and I think I think it's important to say this because it does. I think it does demonstrate why I don't feel like I'm biased towards things like. Um, so, like Democrats, a lot of times will talk about like social programs to help people, and Republicans will talk about like picking a, you know personal responsibility and picking sure. yourself up by bootstraps and whatnot. And it seems, in my experience, like both those things are really necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anyone I've talked to who has worked in, like, a, a, an addiction recovery service or, like, criminal reformation, yeah. they'll be the first to tell you that the person has to want to do it. Like, you can't you, you can't get them to do it unless right. they've made that decision in their mind. They've right. mentally framed themselves. But on the other hand, once they've done that, then you do need to have those systems in You need place access to it. To <laughs> access them. So really, I, you know, it's one of those... That's one example where I, I feel like I kind of see both sides of it. Yeah. And um, I think that's... I've always kind of been like that. I actually got in trouble once in school for like, oh come on, not wanting to pick a side. Like I'm like, well, I see merits from both sides, <laughs> and I, you know, I got like the teacher got mad at me and gave me a bad mark or whatever, which was you know, unacceptable. Didn't, didn't really stand out because I pretty much got bad marks <laughs> as a student anyway. So. Oh, you were a bad student? Oh my god, terrible. Why does this surprise me? Does it really surprise you? I don't yeah. know. I guess 
I was a really good college student, I think. Oh, okay. Because then you could, like... Your prefrontal cortex was fully formed at that point. Well, that's part of it. <laughs> it, it was less, like, rem, less rote, like, memorization sure. or regurgitation. It was more like you could actually engage with stuff and think about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, totally. I, th- I think that's why. And I think I was more engaged because I could pick classes that actually interest me instead of... Yeah. And then, you know, I think part of it just didn't want to. <laughs> Fair I enough. Know. I guess, like, you grow, you know, I, I guess I did some growing up, too. Like, I was pretty bad... I was a pretty bad college student my first mm. my first time around too. That's why I dropped out. Part of why I dropped huh. out. This is interesting to, to me. Yeah, I know. We're like we're learning all kinds of things about BC. Yeah, today. we're just like opening up the whole the secret. The can of know. worms. Yeah, can of worms. Sure. Are you a good student? Um, I would say. Uh, A's, ye- B's. Yes, <laughs> and and I still um, Dave and I had the same favorite professor. We had him at different times. Um, Who was it? UWMC? Uh, yeah, UWMC. Um, Professor Mark Brown, he taught philosophy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I... T- His was one of the classes I had when I dropped out the first time. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I went into college thinking that I really wanted to do philosophy. So, obviously, everybody mm-hmm. talks about Doug Hostler. Um, and they're like, you got to take Hostler. So I took Hostler's class. And I... 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 <laughs> loved him... Yeah. But I just didn't, I I didn't know. The, I was just stunned at, at how I felt about the material and stuff. And I was like, I do I like this? I don't think I do. So yeah. then I took Mark Brown. And uh-huh. the way he kind of breaks information down really worked for the way I retain information. Right. Um, and, you know, he's just a good dude. Um, and he's kind of quiet and kind of quirky. Yeah. And that's, I don't know, that's kind of my style of, of professor, I guess. Um, nice. But I was the one getting all... Oh. Your computer locked itself. Locked? Locked up. Are we... Are we... Password. Oh, no. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. As I'm like, oh, maybe I should quickly look at Facebook. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. And we're back. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I took Mark yeah. Brown's class. I think mm-hmm. it was maybe an introduction to East Asian religions or religious philosophy, and it just, I loved it. I, of course, got an A. I did mm-hmm. extra credit, um, all of these things. And then eventually Dave and I, I don't even know how we were talking about it, but he said that he also had Mark Brown. Um, and on his final paper, same class, mm-hmm. bombed it completely. Wow. And I said, what? And he said, well... My final paper was on Zen Buddhism, and it was supposed to be 10 pages, so I wrote an introduction on what Zen Buddhism was, and I then I just had 10 empty pages. And I'm like, huh, bold. <laughs> no. <laughs> so also, Mark Brown did not appreciate that mode of uh, <laughs> so, uh, giving the information up. Yeah, so. So my first, the very first class I took when I went, Right out of high school, or pretty much right out of high school, was with Peter Okray. Do you remember Peter Okray? I don't he was know. Was an English teacher? No, I don't think I had him. So this very first class, right? Took a semester off, came right. back. He has us do our first paper. So I get my paper back. It is just filled with red ink. I mean, filled. Like I'm looking at this, like, oh my god. <laughs> I, I, maybe I'm just not meant for college. We're done. <laughs> I know. I was like, I was like, uh, maybe I'm just. This is not for me. I don't know. Then I look around the room. Everyone's paper is just full of red. And this was the first paper. First paper. Okay. So he stands up in front of the class and says, "Well, the good news is none of you are so bad that you need to be sent back to." So I, I passed into 102. Okay. None of you need to be passed, sent back to 101. <laughs> The bad news is that's my that's the extent of the good news. <laughs> and then he just like went into all like you know, found out he was voted like the toughest teacher in the entire huh. UW system like ten times in a row. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Got a well, UWMC minus. had that history that that yeah. legacy of being really tough. Yeah, B got a B minus in his class. Was okay, the proudest B minus I've <laughs> ever gotten in my life oh my because gosh. the valedictorian of the class behind or. Ahead of me, one year older than me, had to drop it because it was too hard. Oh wow! So I was like ba, ba, boom, amazing. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. that getting a B minus still kind of gives me a little of anxiety. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got. And the funny thing is, when I returned, I mean, I got mostly A's. Yeah. Because um, by then, I kind of like knew the. I think I was more willing to play the game. Like there's a, 
it's a game. Like there's a certain like sure. expectations. There's like a certain yeah. motions you have to go through. Right. I got kind of tired of it toward the end, so I, I think my grades started to slip a little bit because I made the mistake of doing like the hard classes first. Yeah. And so, or I did like the like the advanced level classes, so I kind of had to go back and fill in the the basics. So then, uh, so then you know, te- I wouldn't really talk in class, and then teachers would call on me to like. Okay. And then, and then I would give them the answer that made them go, oh, that's why he's not talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll leave you alone now. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. Yeah. Well, I'm, like, I'm talking way too much about myself. No, that's okay. Where are we going next? Yeah. Drive this. Yeah, but you went to Point, too. As I did. I went to UWSP. Um, and actually, I kind of feel, you know, when I was in high school, I was really into the art program. Yeah. Um, loved it so much. And I got um, a scholarship to go to UWMC um, to do art so my first year huh. there I kind of just I was like I guess I'm going to be an artist <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I really liked 3D I liked ceramics huh. um, so that was kind of my thing um, but you know after the second semester I had a sculpture mm-hmm. class and it just was not fun like art for me had always been kind of a release and, and fun mm-hmm. and I liked it but it was just it got to the point where I, I didn't like it anymore I didn't like my art I didn't like anything about it and so my second year at UWMC I was like you know what I'm not I'm not doing any of it I'm I don't know just not and I kind of felt like I got to know who I was and what I was interested in and I realized you know writing is kind of the art that I like um I like the written word probably even more than ceramics so cool um yeah so then I went to point um finished my degree you know I was one of the few people uh in my class that did the four-year degree thing you know he had a lot of people at that time five years six years whatever um and I was actually really lucky I graduated in 2006 and you know the recession hit us pretty much 2017 so you graduated pretty much when I started there yeah okay so that's why I didn't know you (laughs) yeah I I think yeah I think fall of 06 I started going there yeah yeah well you know it it was good probably timing I mean the recession really hit because then I mm-hmm. you know I started working at Channel 9 in 2007 and you know I had a pretty good moment um, but then recession hit and you know there were furloughs there were people who mm-hmm. were fired it was really kind of terrifying um, but you know one of the good things that happened was the con- the congressional actions to help people get into homes and stuff like that so you know we took advantage of some of those tax credits and things to buy a house um, oh, yeah but, you know, the timing really does matter on that. I mean, when we're talking about sports and there's an element of luck, like life, there's an element of luck. There like is. being in that right place to do that, um, you have to you have to have the assets to be able to make that decision. I just worry <laughs> about that. I, that's why I worry about journalism. I just, yeah. like, I, I just, like, if I was today, if I was that 28-year-old wanting to get into journalism, like, what would be my avenues? I don't even know. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> it's tough to imagine a dream like you'd almost say well maybe it's not journalism you'd have a better luck maybe writing a novel and getting on the new york yeah, times maybe. bestseller list you know maybe. and making it big <laughs> they're starting the podcast yeah hey <laughs> buy peloton listen to this podcast <laughs> well so what led to your decision to become mayor now we're jumping to become right mayor in. you guys Oops. Fifty-three days until the election. Well, you're. Well, you're. Yeah, that's okay. That's my goal. Of, that's right. That's my goal. Though, right. 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 Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get how we're going. Yeah. Um. So I guess, you know, these decisions you don't make them. People, people will say you make them as a reaction to other people, right? Like, mm-hmm. like somehow I don't, I don't like the current administration, and that's what made my decision. Or I, you. Know, it's not, again, like, it's not about that. And, mm-hmm. you know, part of it, you know, part of the campaign is kind of um, putting your ideas out there and creating this very distinct difference between the current administration and your own. So, like, I'm doing that now, but I would say my decision is not about anybody else but me. Mm-hmm. Um, I I feel lucky to be on the county board. And it doesn't always happen that way a lot, right? Like, a lot of times you hear... And I've heard of people saying, like, well, I think so-and-so is doing a good job, so I'm not going to run. 
you know, yeah. or you know, you'll you'll ask them why the, why someone's running. They're saying, well, I was like so and so, but now they stepped down, so now I'm going to run. Like, well, you see a lot of that on the county board, right? I mean, yeah. you have people that won't run against incumbents and things like that. And they're yeah. famously, and I don't know, I don't know, I never verified whether this was true, but supposedly when they did downsized the county Portage County Board in 2000, yeah, 10 or 11 or whatever it would have been. Uh, Allegedly, two of them met at two of the county board members that were going to be merged met at like midnight at one of the the family like at Willet, like the Willet Park or, Willet oh Reed or whatever gosh. it is, and like flipped a coin. And no, that's that's the story I was told, and I was never able to verify so, whether that was true, and I don't remember who it was. That's anymore, like but. lame old timey mm-hmm. politics that I don't like. That mm-hmm. seems anti democratic. I and, think like why not like I think too many people take it personally. Like why not just right. put your ideas out and say like, hey, I'm gonna run, you're gonna run, if people right. choose you, okay, cool. Like so yeah. that's the thing about county board. When I ran, um I thought I was gonna be running against the guy who was appointed. Um and but you know, it wasn't about him. I didn't even know he existed before he got imp- appointed. Right. So, you know, you have to run on your ideas. Yeah. Um and that's what I'm doing now. I mean, being on county board you learn a lot of a lot, a lot. I can't even tell you. It's like a master's degree. You're learning about all the services and you learn how you're connected to other units of government and things like that. Um, and you know, you're introduced to really cool people like Brad Carger and, and John Robinson and Jeff Zerini and all these different people. Um, and so Jeff Zerini actually is, um, was assigned to me as my County board mentor. And I don't even know if they do that product, that project anymore. Um, Huh. But so we would meet monthly and I'd ask him a million questions and, you know, he would say, well, this is what I think. What do you think? And we kind of had a really good conversation about the policy mm-hmm. stuff. But we also, you know, I'm I'm a lot younger than him. Um, mm-hmm. He was a very successful businessman. He worked at um, Bus Insurance and, you know, Procter mm-hmm. & Gamble. And, you know, he did a lot of big things in his career. And so one of those things... I, 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 you know, I have him. Let's let's talk about career right. stuff. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was talking to him about, though, this is kind of what I'd like to see, I'd like to do. And he's like, well, are, are you sure that what you're doing right now is leading you to the right place? <laughs> and so, you know, he actually, he was challenging. Um, you know, there were moments when I was applying for different kinds of jobs, like maybe working at a different company or whatever. And he said, why are you doing that? I said, well, I mean, it pays like twice as much as I get right now. And he's like, is that what you want? Like, it's not about the money. It's yeah, not. It's true. I made that decision. I know. And yeah. it's, it's really, it's maybe it's our privilege mm-hmm. to be able to say that, but, um, it's at the end of the day, it's very true. And so he challenged me to think about what I actually care about. And mm-hmm. after experiencing local government, you know, we get to go to these different conferences, Wisconsin counties association. Um, I've taken it upon myself to try new things. Um, I went to a governing conference in Minneapolis, met a ton of mayors uh, from all over and you just get super inspired about what they're doing. Like, they're trying brand new, innovative things. Um, and I'm like, why doesn't Wasa do this? Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we trying these new things? So, mm-hmm. like, that's that's kind of where I'm at. Like, I'm super energetic and jazzed about the idea of making Wasa into kind of a, a different concept. Like, trying new things. Like, innovation and pilot programs and things like that. I think that's super important. I'm so. glad you brought that up because... Let's just see. How old are you, Katie? How old am I? Yeah. 36? You're 36. So I'm, I'm not years. that young. <laughs> no, you're like four years younger than me. So you, you were in the 90s Wausau kid. Mm. So you remember like the attitude around Wausau. Like, yes. I was super excited to be from Wausau. No. Usually when I'm in Wausau, I'm getting out of here. I was going to join the Peace Corps. I'm like, eh. join the Peace Corps, yeah. <laughs> Take me to Tanzania, people. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which, again, like thinking about it now, it's kind of funny. But like, Don't you feel that now people don't have that attitude as much? It's different, it yeah. It seems like people are, there's a lot of, it seems like I know a lot of people, and maybe I was just not privy to that back then, but I kind of feel like there's more people here now that are really committed to try to make Wasa cool. and. Yeah. Or, you know, not cool. It sounds so stupid to say, why make Wasa cool? But you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. build things here. They're versus, building. Okay, look yeah. at this. Look at where we're at. Whitewater oh, is. Um, they built a community. I mean, when did they open? September? Yeah. They, yeah, but right. they built this amazing community. If you, co- I was here last Saturday. Oh, May, I think. May. May? Okay. Yeah. Man, I don't know when I started coming here, but. Um, oh, Actually, yeah, it must have been. Whitewater Music Hall. <laughs> 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 um, but they. Uh, 
they built a community. I was here last Saturday, and they had the uh, Black History Month Story Hour. So you had a bunch of kids coming. You had Kaylee McCauley reading those books. Yeah. Um, you had there were like twenty people here speaking German. They have this German coffee yeah, hour. Like coffee is <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah German words. Um, yeah. and it was amazing. And I mean, because really, you know, one of the owners lived in Germany. For yes, like five years. Yeah. yes, mm-hmm. and I mean, this place was packed um, and full of these people that have found their community here. So I feel like you're right. It's taken a while, though. I mean, we've seen um, starts and stops with people, you know, these, but it's, it's, people are invested. Yeah, I feel like there's more people just trying to make things happen here. And I I sometimes think, and maybe this sounds a little cliche, but like the internet age and the age of like, yeah, being able to do things online really helps because A, you can have a job that's in another city and paying really well. Right. So you can work remotely and live here. Mm -hmm. And B, you can start stuff. You don't have to, you know, I can start a podcast and I don't have to go to New York to do that. I can do right. that right here. There's, I can do that anywhere. Right. There's no need to, you know, so I mean, I think there's more of an attitude. And I think it might be generational too. Like there's more of an attitude of like, instead of like going to the big city to do the thing. Yeah. It's like, let's make the big thing here. Let's, yeah. let's try to make that thing here. And that's, it's interesting that that energy is happening. Cause I remember, yeah. Man, in the 90s, like growing up here in the 90s, like as a teenager, like everyone wanted to get the heck out. I know. That's it's all you ever heard. It's funny. Um, when I was in high school, Linda Lawrence was elected mayor. Mm-hmm. And um, she started the Mayor's Youth Action Council. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I probably should have been involved in student government when I was in high school or college. I just wasn't. Um, but I was involved in the Mayor's Youth Action Council. And mm-hmm. that was the thing that we were really trying to do was how do we engage our peers here? Um and we had to lobby to get a stipend of the budget so that we could try a new project. Um, and I remember going to Rockwater and when the Boys and Girls Club Rock was down water. here. Yeah, do you remember? All of this. And I actually, I pulled out an article um, where uh, Pete Wasson uh, wrote the editorial and it proclaimed that Katie Rosenberg is right. You know, you should let 16-year-olds into Blues Fest <laughs> with their wow. parents. Um, just put wristbands on people. Making making uh, yeah. headlines way back then. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I should pull that article out. Oh, man, Rockwater, <laughs> that brings back. Right? You should have like a, there should be like a Rockwater Museum in here. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. They have to have like one of those. I don't know either. They have to have one of those colorful IMAX, you know, because they always have... That was like the big thing. Like, oh yes. man, they're so cool. They have those those I- fancy IMAX with. The, <laughs> and when you think about it now, it's kind of like watching yeah. the Gilmore Girls. You're like, oh, that's quite. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> but, yeah, I yeah. have one of those that they were going to throw out at the at the journal, like the old IMAX. What did did you build a a fish tank out of it? What did you do? I still have it it's sitting in my basement. I tried well, to sell it to Dino Corvino, but he he was going to buy it, and he's like, oh, no, I have too much junk. I can't buy it. <laughs> It's true. I, I, I'm surprised you still have it. Didn't I just get felt bad. Like, I was like, it didn't get it's it's because the it never got to the basement or the garage. <laughs> My Marie Kondoing didn't go that far. Okay, so. okay, got it, got it. Oh. I think the book is still lost in my clutter, so I get it. I do, Rock. Yeah, <laughs> irony, right? <laughs> but yeah, Rockwater. That was like because when I was in bands, when I was in my teens. Oh my bands, gosh! That was like the place you could go play. Like, yes, and you could go there, and you know, even just being a teenager drinking seems quaint like kids go to starbucks all the time now but like going there and getting a mocha and yeah. you know i mean really it was a place we didn't really have anything like yeah, that yeah we didn't have um there was something's brewing otherwise right and i didn't. definitely overstayed my welcome at something's brewing a lot of a lot of people <laughs> i know did but there was no like yeah there was no the starbucks and there weren't really a lot of places to hang out so when i Rock guess we had a mall up, right at the yeah. time you could actually like you could go shopping that's true oh, well yeah a lot of people are mall rats <laughs> yeah you know? I could take the bus there on a Saturday. I remember when Kevin Smith's movie came out, it was like, oh my God, mall rats. <laughs> like they made a movie about us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's super cool. Pet stores. I'm trying to, like, how did I, you know, high school sports? Did I mall have a pet store? Um, did the mall have a pet store? I can't I remember. Like it, I, I don't I rem- feel like it did. I remember Cloverbelt Pets more um, in yeah. Weston. That's right. And the Stevens Point Mall had a, had a pet store. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Man, pet stores don't exist anymore. You just have animals on Facebook. Sure. Right. <laughs> Facebook or, yeah. What are, like, I don't I even need an actual pet. I just look on the internet for the animals. I guess, well, I guess there's like those, uh, I guess there's like those big box ones, right? Like, I suppose so. Oh, Petco and all of that. Petco yeah. and all that, yeah. 
Yeah, that, but you don't like accidentally come upon that. <laughs> but you can like, yeah, you can order things online too. Like if you wanted a bird, you could get a bird. You could get a parrot or something. Yeah. I was reading some mother's uh, discontent about ordering crickets online, and <laughs> if they're not packed correctly, you can have a problem. We have a pet frog at City Pages. And you so do, we, yeah. We call it House Frog because our designer Alex found it in her house. Oh my gosh! So we call it. House. How long have you had this? Oh, it's been a couple of years, I think. Maybe a year and a half. It doesn't get lonely? Uh, okay, I'm positing feelings it, on a I frog. Don't it, I don't think it does. <laughs> it seems perfectly happy. I think it was meant to be temporary, and then and then we just kind of liked it. So yeah, I get she it. She feeds it crickets. She has to buy it crickets oh, all the time. Yeah. That's well, I'm glad it's it. well well taken care of. House frog. <clears throat> yeah, I forgot about house frog. I don't pay much <laughs> attention to it lately. We had a bird for a little while, too. Oh, Alex really? Had, yeah, Alex had found a bird. It was like this special. Okay, kind of... we need Alex here to talk about the yeah, stuff that she does. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll have to have Alex on the podcast sometime. No, she's sponsored somehow, by White like, She found this like spare bird, or not spare. Um, spare bird. Like lost bird. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Extra bird in the pocket. And no, she found this bird and then she brought it into the office and like tracked down. I think she tracked down a lady who like breeds them. So, mm -hmm. but it was like this really fancy pigeon. Oh. It was like really pretty. I was like, "That's a cool bird." Like, yeah, I would like. I wouldn't mind having that bird. Mr. Higgins, my cat, would not love that bird. Yeah, Mr. Higgins probably would get into. It'd be he would see it destroying it, maybe. It, yeah. yeah, maybe someday when he doesn't have a bird. But <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So, how do you feel about running for mayor? Like, what's it like? I mean, yeah. Do you feel like it's just like? Because you know, I think I think you and Bob are both pretty nice people. Like just getting to, I like to think so. on one and like elections, yeah, you can't you can't help it. They just get you know going all the way right. back to Jefferson and Adams. Right. I mean, I'm just we don't have duels right now, so that's right. great. No duels yet. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's weird. I think initially when I initially filed, um, and mm. you know I didn't say anything for a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, I know. We filed really early too. Right? I did. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just I you know. This is different than county board. Um, I wanted to give myself time to introduce myself to other people. You know, there's the fundraising element. Um, there's a variety of things. So running initially, starting off a year ago, um, it was kind of fun and exciting because you're mm -hmm. like, hey, here I am. I have ideas. Right. It's really positive and fun. Like, it's going to be like this forever. Um, and then, mm -hmm. you know, then you start... <laughs> you start realizing that, oh, there's some other stuff at play here. It's not just about, like, I, I can't just go out and share only my ideas because, yeah. you know, you put yourself at a disadvantage. So um, now you're kind of, okay, how do I respond to things um, without being whiny or without being really mean or, like, how do you do this? Well, you can, yeah, and you can see this play out on Facebook. Like, you instantly become, like, yeah, not a target necessarily, right. but, like, Oh, I something, stopped reading Facebook happened. comments so long ago. Yeah, something. Then I, I saw this play out on Facebook, like where a, something controversial would happen, and be like, "What does how does Katie feel about this?" And then like you were, I would you know, comment. You would, yeah. And did you stop doing that? I no? did. I well, I can't read those comments anymore, and it's not yeah. good. Um, and it's just not it's not good for anybody if you're going to be like stuck mm -hmm. in the comments all the time. We all know it better than that. Yeah. Um, so Keith, Keith Ulig once told me, Brian, never read the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Keith Ulig, smart man, wise man. Very wise man. And also he knows where his priorities are, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> work out every day, dog, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Running, bikes, dog. Yeah. 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 I trade, I trade dog for cat, but. Right, right. Yes. I, I don't have anything against dogs. I only have a cat because sure. I'm like gone all the time and just, I, I wouldn't be able to take care of one. Yeah. But. I mean, it takes a house cat to have a house cat. Exactly. Right. I don't know. Um, so yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's weird now. Um, and especially, so when we talk about things, when you called me a policy wonk, I also am kind of a nerd about the rules. And when I see stuff and I'm like, Hey, that's not following the rule. That's not following the rule. So like it, it, it like bothers me sometimes when right. I see the rules not being followed. And so I have to decide, am I going to mm -hmm. make a big deal out, out of this every single time? And if I do, I'm not talking about the issues that I care about. So, you know, I filed the one complaint um, because I didn't think that was fair. I didn't think it was following the rules. Um, but, you know, then I saw another thing yesterday um, with city letterhead going out to all the businesses. And you just wonder, like, that's not okay. But, I, I you know what, I'm going to tweet about it and then we're done. We're done. <laughs> right. So I'm just going to move on. Um, but 
you know, that that's tough for me um, because I think that the rule, following the rules, like we have them for a reason. There are ethical impl- implications. I'm mm-hmm. a philosophy person. Like I care about that stuff. So that's the, but I also have to make sure that I'm talking to people about the issues that matter to me. Mm-hmm. So really what's, something just, that, what's something that surprised you running from there that you didn't anticipate? Um, I guess I didn't really think about how many people are actually paying attention to all of the things like watching the news and Mm -hmm. you know we keep hearing that people don't watch news anymore they don't read newspapers this and that uh they're only on facebook but that's not actually true i mean yesterday Mm -hmm. i was on apparently i was on every news station and i got texts from every single one of my friends (laughs) and they're like i saw you on the news so it's just one of those things that oh people are paying attention i went to go buy some cheese today and -hmm. there was um a lady in the store at the same time and and she like yells across. She's like, "Hey, are you the one that's running for mayor?" I was like, "I am. <laughs> I'm also buying an absurd amount of cheese, so don't judge me or do. Do you like this?" <laughs> but so it's kind of interesting. So um, this is part of your platform. You're pro cheese. Pro cheese. Okay. I am. You know, I did the veganuary thing in January. It was tough, but you know, back I on track. Up cheese. I couldn't do it. I know. Yeah. I have to say, December I ate so much cheese that. Again, that was a problem. So I'm trying to be a little bit more cognizant of how much cheese is, you know, riding my bike, don't eat too much cheese. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Pokey Pedal Bob said this about ice cream and not cheese, but it could apply. He said you have to have ice cream rules because otherwise, what would prevent me from just eating ice cream all the time? No, it's true. It's, you know, Pokey Pedal Bob. He's a wise man. Yeah, that cat. I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah, so for those who don't know, Pokey Pedal Bob is a guy who used to read, lead these Pokey Pedal bike rides at Stevens Point, and he was a former Intel uh, chip engineer. Did not know that. Yeah, uh, math, and before that was a math professor. Oh my gosh, did not yeah. know that. Yeah, I actually saw him on Saturday. Huh. Um, we went to the food fair, and then we got, oh my gosh. Then we got coffee. At did you get one of those potatoes? No, the line was really long. Yeah, because they're amazing. I went. I didn't even go. I didn't even get like. I didn't do the food. I just went up and down the aisles. I bought some. <laughs> I bought some mushrooms from uh, Agora. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, Segura and Sun. Shout out, guys. Shout out. And uh, can we just talk about the mushroom yummy. thing for a second? Yeah, let's talk mushrooms. Okay, so I serve on the county board with John Robinson, yeah. and one day, since I live here, sometimes um, I'm mm-hmm. sitting here. Uh, and I hear his voice. He's talking. He's very he, and and I look over and I see him and he's got this box, and this printed out piece of paper and this spray bottle, and I can tell I can see what's going on. Like he's giving he's giving Leslie some instructions on how to do the yeah. So he is in Alabama right now. And he has Leslie babysitting his mushroom. <laughs> and if you go over That's there, you can amazing. see it in his box. Yeah, so it's very funny to me. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring that up. Yeah, after, please after mock him a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I am gonna mock him. Yeah. But he's real into it. It's great. Well, I mean, it was a gift from Elizabeth. I used I to it. like, I used to like constantly, um, I used to constantly er, nudge him about running for the mayor just because I knew he didn't want to. So I'd be like, I'd be like, yeah, there's a, even before like. Milky was elected, sure. and, you know, and there was like four candidates for the right. last one. I was like, hey, John, you know, not, it's no, not too late to add a fifth. And mostly because I was teasing him. I didn't think he would actually would. You know, he's one of those people that it's good to know. Um, he's got yeah. a lot of experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, but also, if, if you start asking him questions, he's going to give you a list of things to follow up on. He's not yeah. going to give you the answers. No, so, yeah. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think yeah. about this? So it's been very interesting. <laughs> yeah, JR. I call him JR in my notes. Oh, I have, yeah, that's I have funny. nicknames for all the, every, pretty oh my much gosh. everyone. What's my nickname? Uh, KR or KRO. KRO. Yeah, just for any is Z Diddy. Z Diddy. Yeah, I'm going to start calling him sometimes that. Sometimes I want to make it fun. Yeah. <laughs> They're, not, they're never derogatory. They're just they're, they're mostly designed for speed. So like sure, the fastest, sure. I get it. Yeah, the fastest I can type them because otherwise, if someone's name's like Hunk Skabitabits, it's like, I don't want to type all that out. <laughs> Skabitabits. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about that word the other day. Like, my, my parents <laughs> used to use that, and I don't know if there's like an origin of that or. My parents did not use that. <laughs> I know. Weird things. But yeah. You know, I would think running for mayor would be a pretty intense ordeal. Like, yeah. But. For someone who's like a super policy wonk, I think you would. I think that that would be the fun part for you, I would imagine. Yeah, it's been really interesting because once you start talking out loud, I noticed this last week after the forum. Um, once you say say these things, 
people start reaching out to you with information. So I started talking mm-hmm. about partnerships. What do I get? I had somebody from um, Weston. I had somebody from Rib Mountain. Um, I had somebody from Schofield. They all kind of reached out. They're like, hey, here's some ideas that I have. Um, what do you think about this? So, you know, it's it's really great. And actually, you know, talking about the water treatment plant, the water um, that was one of the mm-hmm. questions that came up and was kind of controversial, apparently. Um, right. But I had an opportunity to talk to a couple other people about that. And, you know, now I have a ton mm-hmm. of homework to do. Right. Um, and, you know, I asked some pointed questions to these people I was talking to. So, mm-hmm. I mean, again, it gives you that yeah. opportunity to do that extra research into something mm-hmm. that maybe you wouldn't. Do you see any pitfalls for running for mayor, like any fallout or anything that whether win or lose that might come out of it? I mean, are there any concerns going in? I just yeah. always wonder about those things. So it's weird right now because, you know, I, I have a pretty intense, I mean, maybe intense isn't the right word, but I mean, I have an involved job at Foot Locker. It's not like mm-hmm. I can just not do my job. Right. Um, but it's also a very public job interview for a different job altogether. So, mm-hmm. you know, I had, be- I had to be very careful, um, going into this, like, how am I going to um, approach my boss, <laughs> my boss's boss? Right. You know, I mean, even, you know, our chairman and CEO spent a lot of time in Wasa, so he knows who I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it, you you do kind of think about what you're saying and how that has ripple effects on maybe your job or the people you work with. And I imagine, too, I imagine it's different than county board because county board yeah. is like, oh, great, we got someone... You know, from a company's perspective, right. they're like, oh, that's good that we have someone. Or they don't even notice or, or care. Or, <laughs> like, yeah, maybe. I mean, really, county yeah. board is one of those things that if you don't know about it, it doesn't exist. I mean, that's you don't true. think about it. Who yeah. are these county board people? Right. So, but yeah, this is lot, different. There's a lot of people that don't even know what a county board supervisor does. Right. Or like what that means. So I'm, I'm me for... I'm still learning, man. You know, me <laughs> before I... Before I uh, became a full-time journalist covering government. And, like, I'm sure I didn't know a whole lot about that stuff right. either. Actually, it was kind of funny. Like, I, I remember going to the library when I started getting, like, really interested in politics for a while. Yeah. Like, I was like, well, what... I was like, well, what does a city council person, what does a mayor actually do? So I thought, well, where do I get information? Oh, you go to the library. <laughs> That's where the information... That's all the books are there, right? And then you see all the state statutes, and you're like... Whoa. Yeah, I know. Well, I was, then I was talking, and I'm just like... I'm like, yeah, I'm just... You know, everyone was like, "What are you doing this for a book report or like, you know, a, a school project?" I'm like, I "No, know, I'm, I'm like, no, I just want to know. <laughs> I just want to know what this, these, yeah, what does a mayor actually do? What does yeah. a city council person do? Like, what's involved?" In so that's an interesting thing that you're bringing up because, uh-huh. um, you know, I come from a certain kind of a tradition where I think that it's important for a leader of a municipality to be a thought leader um, mm-hmm. and to, you know, be bringing other things to the table and uh, after the debate you know I talked to somebody I keep calling it a debate and it was a forum and I'm I'm trying to figure out like is there a substantive difference between debate and forum so I'm using those interchangeably everyone Mm -hmm. Um, again like why do I get wrapped up in those details (laughs) Um, but somebody came up to me and they said you know um, I think you just need to focus on what your statutory obligations are and that's it that is it and I you know I can I can appreciate that um, I can appreciate why you would think that um, and say that. And, you know, frankly, paying for things, it's a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. And especially money right now, you have, I mean, you're you're not getting any more money from the state. Even, no matter what they're telling you, I mean, it's getting spent. Yeah. Um, so you're not, you can't do a lot of new things. But I still think there's opportunity to be, again, like the thought leadership, um, innovative, I mean, you, I don't want to do the same things. I want to make sure that we're inspiring people. Well, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up, too, because I, I, I guess I never really did get a good answer. And I think mm. now that I know what I know, I realize why I didn't get a good answer, because mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of different... I think everyone who takes the job approaches it differently mm-hmm. than, than the next person. Like, yeah. um, uh, you know, you could read the statutes and, like... You know, at yeah. that time it was just like, like yeah, no, know, it's super. Reading, why but. did they write them that way, and why can't we mm-hmm. update it to plain English first of all? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just like I, I never really got a good answer, and I feel like I could probably give young me a better one at this point, or like sure. someone who was in that position. I could say, yeah, well, this is roughly what they do, and you know, there's different approaches, but basically, yeah, I think I think in a lot of ways, a mayor is a thought leader. I, mean, I think so too, because otherwise, you just have a, an administrator, right? Like you know, I, I, like. And the one thing about Halverson, I, I think I can say, <laughs> is that the man had a vision. Yep. You know, whether you agreed with it or not, 
uh, not everyone, obviously there was a lot of disagreement on it, but he had a very strong vision and he knew how to get done what he wanted to get done. Now, did he, you know, not everyone liked the way he did things um, or the, you know, the, 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 the sure. you know, some people felt like he almost treated the council like a rubber stamp. Um, you know, and, and also I think some of the complaints have been sort of the opposite of that. That it's, right. it's too much is is loose. By the you time have to collaborate. So, you know, it's like mm-hmm. it's. I had this talk with Tammy the other day, and I think there's a there's a balance there somewhere. Like, well, you have to. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. you have these different functions of government. You have the executive, mm-hmm. and then you have the council, mm-hmm. and really, you need to work together to get the right right kind of mold. Well, I mean, the executive is supposed to be managing that staff, so mm-hmm. really, it's important. Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that happened in Stevens Point is that eventually. You know, Halverson ha- kind of had a strong arm approach. I don't think I'm sure. speaking. No, of, I don't think so. I don't think I'm leveling an opinion to say that. I think that's anyone would agree with that. And uh, he's a very smart guy, mm-hmm. and he knew what he wanted to get done. But I think eventually the council kind of turned on him, mm-hmm. and you know, eventually he dropped out. And I, uh, he was going to run for um, the assembly seat when. But Louis when Malevsky? Malevsky right. I assumed Louis Malevsky was going to run for the seventh congressional seat when Obi retired. Yeah, that was a little surprise, huh? Man, wasn't that exciting. (laughs) And then uh, Halverson was considering running, but I think he wanted to get out of politics because his kids were getting to that age where they were, you know, aware enough, old enough to be aware of, oh, people are calling my dad, uh, all these names, you know. Right, right. I think anyone is going to, you know, no matter what, I mean, you can't please everyone. If you're in a public eye, you're going to make people mad. Yeah, no way. Yeah. You know, I kind of give my dad a little bit of credit, too, because, Mm -hmm. you know, he he had um, people complaining about him all the time, but he never really hid that from me. Um, And, you know, I'm I'm a lot younger than my brother. My brother was out of the house um, by the time my dad was really involved in politics. Um, Mm -hmm. But... (laughs) You know, I we were getting anti-Semitic mail. We were getting kind of kind of weird that phone too, calls. Because yeah, you guys actually aren't Jewish, right? But no, your name sounds I, Jewish. I guess right, right. I don't know. I don't, and I, again, I don't. like if somebody is anti-Semitic to you, what do you say? Right. You don't I'm like my friends. <laughs> you know, I mm-hmm. my friends are Jewish. I, I there are assumptions about me and my my past. Yeah, it's funny because I went a long time like not really like I knew I, I knew about Jewish people, but I didn't. I didn't know nearly enough to know someone if someone was Jewish or not. I really didn't care, I guess. But yeah, um, so it, the, it's always been really baffling to me. But yeah, one of my friends, one of my good friends in my twenties and into my thirties, like um, his dad, you know, they were Jewish. Um, his dad would get all kinds of. His dad was a teacher, and he. It's mind blowing, actually. Stuff. It still exists, and yeah. even more so sometimes now. It's well, tough. I think it's. It hasn't. I've heard it's increased. There, you know. Yeah. Recently. Oh that, that's so crazy that like that's like another layer that is so weird and random. That, it is weird, yeah. um, but you know I I have people that I talk to about it. Um, and they mm-hmm. you know they face I mean actual Jewish people who grew up in the tradition. And they're mm-hmm. like yep 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 <laughs> that is what we're facing. So it kind of gives you a little bit of empathy um, that maybe you wouldn't have if you didn't experience it. Right. I just don't even I can't even understand what the problem is. But. Well, and you've been, so you've been, you've been to Japan too. Yeah. So, you know, the one, the one thing I, I tell people is that, and I know it's not, it's not, I'm not saying it's a comparative experience, but it kind of gives you like a little glimpse. Like now I feel like I sort of understand what it's like to be a minority. Cause I, in Japan, you're like, you're the guy gene. You're the guy gene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like everyone's looking at you, everyone's paying attention to you. Like just that, it, it, it's hard to explain what that feels like until you actually experience it. And you're like, okay, I get it. Like, I can never blend in. I'm always right. the other. And that's always going to inform all the interactions that happen. And it's like, you know, I most people were mostly nice in Japan. I had, of I had a course, couple of people polite. that were, you know, I had, I had one that, like, went off of me about George Bush, which was kind of weird, like, the first time I was there. Right. That was actually very, con- I was there in 20, 2005. Mm-hmm. And, um... You know, I went to the, uh, it was the 60th anniversary of the Nagasaki bombing in oh, yeah. Hiroshima. And I went to the Nagasaki Peace Museum with my Japanese family that I was staying with. And it was, it was an intense moment. You know, they had those letters to George Bush at mm-hmm. that museum, actually. And you just, you know, it's one thing to learn about something. And it's a whole nother to just be there. And like, to wow, there, yeah. this is not that far removed. And I'm sure my great-grandparents 
would have been like, whoa, what are you doing going to Japan? Right. <laughs> well, I remember my my grandpa thought it was weird that I was going to Japan. Yeah. You know, he didn't like, I mean, he didn't like say anything racist, but he just thought it was weird that like, right. what are you going to do there? Because I think he had been there. Yeah. I think in his, when he was a veteran, I think he had stopped there on leave or something. Like, oh, I don't sure. Think he served like over Okinawa there, or something. Yeah, maybe. I think yeah. so. And uh, my, my I keep when I took Aikido, my Aikido teacher had served in in uh, the Nagasaki area. Man, and that's where he, he was like one of the first white people to learn Aikido. Oh my gosh! Yeah, he's still alive. He's very old in his <laughs> late eighties now. That's yeah, amazing. It is, and uh, but yeah, that experience to me really, really that that's always stuck with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I, I kind of get like I think it's important for people to. I, I wish everyone could go and experience that just to know what it's like. You know, it just it just gives you that perspective, I think. Yeah. But I was going to tell you, so I, I don't think I've ever brought this up before. But oh, like boy. The first time I became aware of you, yeah. I was, like, cursing your name. And here's why. <laughs> he was cursing my name. All right, let me just unveiling get comfortable a, Unveiling Let's on, go. on Pull the, curtain the Keep back, It Awesome man. podcast. Yeah. So, Tammy, like, famously would not let me write about my tr- my Japan travels. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, she never wanted to. Yeah. Have, I never did a travel section on it. Sure. I, even though I'd been there, like, at that point twice, you know, yeah. two times. Had no, it would not let me. And then, and then, like. I know where this is going. <laughs> and then, and then you had a piece in there. I was like, who is this Kitty Rosenberg? <laughs> How dare she? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so maybe I should tell you. I was like, oh, she just gets to you because she's Jim Rosenberg's daughter. Well. I feel like I, I pitched that. it pretty well. You so here's did. the deal. So I went in yeah. 2005. Um, I think mm-hmm. we both did the Guy Healy thing, right? Like you yeah. went there. So that's yeah, what I did, did too, yeah. um, which was amazing. All college students should do that. Yeah, mine was 2008, so yeah. we were pretty close. So I loved it. Um, mm-hmm. And then when I got married to Dave... That was 2007. Yeah, I should explain for people that know Kai Healy was like this college program where you oh, basically, sure. they kind of paid your way to go to Japan and you stayed with host families and yep. then in exchange you would help them teach English. Immersion In these immersion, camps. these three day immersion camps. Yeah. yeah. So I was located yeah. in the Nagasaki area. That's uh, Tokyo. Fukuoka, that area. Mm-hmm. Um, I did get up to Kyoto and Osaka. Nice. Um, okay. So I did that, you know, it's like what, mm-hmm. two months, three months, whatever that is. And, um, man, I'm really distracted by these costume changes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could kind of see through the curtain. Um, okay. <laughs> huh. um, so in, when I got married in 20, 2007, um, my, our parents, Dave's, Dave's parents and my parents, um, said they would both give us an amount of money uh, for the wedding. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I was like, well, we're getting married cheap, first of all, because why would we waste all the money? And then oh, I took... That makes me so happy. I know. Well, and so then I took my portion of the money, and I, I said, all right, I'm booking a trip. Dave, I'm booking our honeymoon. And I don't mm-hmm. know, did I say it out loud? I don't know what I did, mm-hmm. but I, I, I don't know. He was shocked by the fact that I did this. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and I booked us um, almost two weeks in Kyoto, uh, because I, that was my favorite part when, we went to, when I went to Japan. Mm-hmm. So Kyoto was something else. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It's, it's like old. no other and, part of Japan. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And you you have access to all different kinds of places, too. So, anyway, booked that. And um, <laughs> Dave had never left the country before. <laughs> so his first trip is to Japan. <laughs> wow, that's intense. <laughs> and Actually, so, <laughs> and fair enough, Japan was my first time out of the country, oh, too. Oh, okay, so you yeah. kind of have that same experience. Um, yeah, <laughs> and, I remember walking... Maybe he went to Canada. I remember Maybe. the first like full day we were there. We, he hadn't like, left the continent. <laughs> we like went went to like this bookstore and like just we're walking around. Yeah. And I remember just being like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, everything. It's small. It's packed. It's weird. It's you. The smells so and hard, the. It's so hard to explain to people because it can be the like pachinko super, machines and the cigarette right. smoke and the. <laughs> it can be like super. Sur- Japan can be like super serene and super like sensory overload. Yes, at like the it, same time. At the same time, sometimes. I mean, I remember like. Walking, walking in one part of Tokyo, and like there was all these skyscrapers, and then all of a sudden there was like the Shinto shrine and like all this shrubbery and stuff. And, and then, then they're growing, again. then they're growing like <laughs> little, little tiny amounts of rice and these tiny little urban mm-hmm. patties. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I booked that trip. Dave went to Japan. I mean, he was, yeah. he was a shocked that I had taken 
my family's portion of the wedding money to book this, and then B, that he was going to Japan. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of my pitch uh, because he experienced an amount of culture shock that I think, yeah. um, you know, you hear about culture shock all the time and you think, oh, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to experience that. I, I'm worldly, um, you know, Dave teaches cultural anthropology. So, you know, he even teaches about culture shock, yeah. um, but there was definitely an amount of culture shock there. And um, I remember actually the last time I have ever eaten at McDonald's was actually in Kyoto because oh, nice. I think we were about a week in and he was like, we are eating at McDonald's. I'm not eating any more rice crackers. I've had enough of fish. So. <laughs> and then he was still in for a rude awakening. Cause like, even their menu I know, they put like squid sauce on yeah. it. <laughs> it was really bad. Um, but yeah, that was the last. So I haven't had, um, I haven't had McDonald's for 13 years. Wow. Um, wow. There you go. Um, but yeah, so that was my this pitch. This episode to of the broadcast <laughs> podcast is brought to you by McDonald's. Uh, Have yeah. it your way. Is that, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm loving it. Loving it. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. You're yeah. Sorry, we only have five minutes. Five minutes, all right. Oh my gosh, we got to wrap this up. Well, okay. to wrap it up, like, so then I... I got the story and you didn't. Yeah, you got the story and didn't, but I read the story. I was like, okay, it was actually pretty good. Okay, yeah, good. So I was good. like... I'm glad you liked that. Yeah, it was a good story. Good, yeah. And then, yeah, so... Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, other than Japan, like, uh, it was a good times, but I think we're, uh, I think we're good, like... Yeah. Uh, so where uh, people want to, like, find... Sh Information find about me. Yeah, gonna, okay, so I have a website, uh -huh. uh, www.rosenbergforwasa.com. Uh -huh. um, I'm trying to keep that updated, but it's real tough. <laughs> yeah, for sure. um, I, I also have a Facebook page, again, Rosenberg for Wausau. Uh -huh. um, if you are into the Twitter thing, I am on Twitter, Twitter. at Katie Rosenberg. Um, and then, you know, I... Mm -hmm. I'm in the news pretty regularly, so you should be able That's to true. read what I have to say. Yeah. Just turn on the TV. She might be on <laughs> Yeah, there. I might be there. Who knows? Yeah. Accidentally. <laughs> well, and I'm BC Kowalski. Uh, you can find my work at City Pages, of course, and uh, <laughs> also BC Kowalski, BC underscore Kowalski on both Twitter and Instagram. Instagram. Um, I believe on Facebook it's BC of frugal wheels so if you want to learn about how to bicycle and oh, yeah. save money you can go to www.frugalwheels.com and check it out so this is a this is an episode like a two-part series we're doing i'm sitting down with katie today and i'm sitting down with mayor milky uh in two weeks most likely and uh but you're you'll be well, by the time you're seeing this it'll be they'll both be out simultaneously so Okay. Uh, the main issue is, like, I want to sit down with both of the candidates and really just talk to them like people. So we talked a little bit about the mayor ra race, but not, like, I, I mostly wanted to talk about, get to know, like, each candidate as a person. I feel like I didn't idea. do my job of, like, campaigning right now, so. Whoops. That's okay. Campaigning <laughs> by not campaigning, maybe. So. Okay. Yeah, and these are pretty rad sneakers. I don't know if we oh. can see those on video, but oh, yeah. they're pretty rad. I'm accidentally yeah. wearing cat socks, because that's one thing you don't do oh. anymore is laundry. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> So we didn't, get, we didn't get to talk about your sneaker game, but oh, maybe yeah. another time. So It's a problem. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being on, Katie. Yes, thank you and, so much. you know, I make everyone say, uh, keep it awesome. So you got to say, end it off with, keep it awesome. Oh, oh boy. Your, your, your tagline. tagline. All right. I guess we're going to keep it awesome. Keep it awesome. <laughs> Bye, everyone.